the main T-Rex ruled the world for almost two and a half decades, beating off competition from smaller fry. Um, but the cloud will in and make them dead. And the big beasts of Microsoft, Facebook, and Google produce their own monsters, uh, Bible, uh, Cloud, and Buck. And so the genetic diversity in the build system um, uh, gene pool had increased quite a bit. And we could also see that um, uh, if you look through the right spectacles, what, what build systems do is also being done by other things like Excel and Nix. They've got their things to do, there's dependencies, and you want to rebuild as little as possible. So the, uh, that, lead, that genetic diversity leads to questions like this. Which one should I choose? What exactly does it mean to be correct? Can I combine the good properties of one build system with the good properties of another? Or are somehow those properties in conflict with each other? Um, and maybe there are unexplored variants that just don't exist at all. So that's the problem that we address in this paper. Before I can tell you about that, though, I have to tell you a bit about what the good properties of a build system might be. Here are four. One, minimality. So minimality is fundamentally what we want build systems to do, rebuild as little as possible. Here I've got a little dependency tree. If I change just having rebuilt everything, if I then just change make.c, I want to recompile make, uh, sorry, main.c, I want to recompile main.o, but not util.o, and then I have to relink. I just want to do as little as possible. Um, some build systems, but not all, support something called early cutoff, which is that if you uh, have rebuilt main.o, but you just change a comment in main, so the binary is bit for bit identical, well then, there's no need to relink. So that's early cutoff. Another thing you might want to do, and this is the cloud rolling in, is cloud build. So you've got a lot of people across an enterprise. They're all mainly using the same libraries and source code. So perhaps somebody else has already built uh, the whole thing all the way up to main.exe, and now you're doing it. Then you don't want to get any of the intermediate artifacts. You just want to download main.exe from the cloud. Then you change util.c. That means you have to build util.o and then upload that to the cloud for somebody else. And you have to uh, download main.o from the cloud, link it, and build main.exe and upload that. So that's a whole lot of new plumbing that happened with cloud build systems. The fourth good property you might want in a build system is to support dynamic dependencies. So here's an example where your, your main.exe is part of a release that has some documentation. But in this file docs.tuxt, is a, a sort of manifest of things that you want to be included. And one day you add, the, add a line to that file saying, include readme, and then the readme file now becomes a dependency of release.tar. So now the dependencies of each node in this dependency graph depend on the values computed by other um, inputs to it. And that's called dynamic dependencies. I'm going to pause a moment, but it is really super, they're super important. They're present, for example, in Excel. So if you say equals A1 plus A2, it's clear that formula depends on A1 and A2. Uh, but Excel has this indirect function. It takes a, a string and treats it as a cell reference. So here, this string A ampersand, that string concatenation with C1. So that'll take A, concatenate it with 1. That makes A1. So to look up the value of cell A1. If you change the value of cell C2, change the value C1 to uh, 7, then it'll look up at the value of cell A7 and so forth. So you don't know what the dependencies of this formula is statically. You only know, as it were, at runtime or at eval time. OK, dynamic dependencies are actually really important in practice, but they're not that common in build systems. And they're quite ubiquitous. Here's a, uh, an include file. Um, you might, in your C file, you might say, if uh, Linux is defined, then include Linux.8. So whether or not this job depends on Linux.8, the file depends on the setting of this Linux uh, you know, uh, CPP variable, which itself is a textual thing in some other file. So dynamic dependencies in practice are ubiquitous. And there are all sorts of workarounds that I will not trouble you with, you with but they are painful. We have, in GHG's build system, experienced this pain uh, in a very visceral way. So if I was you, I'd just go for a system which has dynamic dependencies. But the thing about this, the, the, um, the paper that I want to encourage you to read is that we don't just waffle about various aspects of build systems. We make it very concrete by modeling them in small but completely executable Haskell programs. So a complete build system for us is sort of 20 or 30 lines of Haskell. And I'm going to show you some of that. Um, and, uh, and that allows us to explore the rich design space of build system in a very concrete and precise way. So here's what I have to first establish some vocabulary. What is a build system? It, uh, takes, it brings up to date a store that maps keys to values. So then we've got keys, which are the names of things. So in a typical build system, a key would be a file name, a value would be the file content, the store would be the file system, and the task, which is user-specified, says how to bring a key up to date. That would be the make rules. 
And I've, there's another column here for Excel that I think would be very, uh, very self-explanatory. So then, what is a build system modeled as a Haskell function? Well, um, a build system is just a function that takes a description of some tasks, that's a user-supplied tasks, a key and a store, and returns a new store in which the key has been brought up to date, which perhaps means bringing other keys um, up to date. Um, so what is this tasks thing? It's just a mapping of keys to, well, a, a maybe task. Why maybe? Because it returns nothing for an input key, like a, a, an input file, doesn't have a rule to make it. If there's a rule to make it, then it returns just of, and then a task. What is then a task? So this is the first time things get interesting. Here is what a task is. It's a function that produces a value, that's the arrow V part, but in doing so, it needs the value of its dependencies. So it's going to need some kind of K to V function, a kind of callback that it can use to get the values of its dependencies. But that callback has to be somehow stateful, because in uh, saying, oh, okay, I, I need the value of this other file or key or formula, there may need to be some work to do to bring that up to date. So that may be an effectful thing that needs to be recorded. So that's reflected by this F. That's the effects that this task can do. Um, but now, what is F? Oh, so here we parameterize in the following way. We say, any F will do, provided it satisfies constraints C. So C is typically something like monad or applicative, but the task itself is polymorphic in F. This, was, this is not an obvious thing that took us a little while to do. I'll come back to it in a second, but I thought I'd give you an example first. Here is a definition of tasks for a spreadsheet in an applicative, right? So you can see the, uh, uh, here there's the, the applicative, and then it's uh, the um, keys are strings, the values are integers. Um, and so tasks, remember, is just a function from keys to maybes. So, and it pattern matches on the key, which is a string. Um, and then it returns, for the, for the cells that have formulae, it returns just of task. Task is the data constructor for um, the task thing. And then the lambda fetch, that's the callback, right, of type key to FV. And then, there's, um, then we have to fetch the value of A1, fetch the value of A2, and add them together. And then the intermediate line noise is just the applicative stuff for gluing those things together. Okay, so it's very easy to write these task things. Here now is an example of a complete build system. Right, the, whole, the whole thing is just these eight lines. Um, so uh, let's see. Busy is a build system that takes a task, of course, a key and a store. And it's going to um, somehow uh, it's going to run the store in a state mode. So, it's, so this fetch thing um, at the bottom is a local function that takes a key and runs in a state monad in which the state is this store. Remember, the store is the key value mapping, essentially. Um, so what does fetch do? Fetch, given a key, it says, oh, look it up in the tasks. That's the case tasks. And then it's going to have to say, oh, if it's there, if there is a formula to make this thing, then it says, OK, let's run the task. And it has to give it the callback. What is the callback? It's just fetch. So we pass it fetch. So there's the recursion. This is the way the system is recursive. And then having got the value back, we'll stick it in the store to record that it's been done and return the new value. Um, on the other hand, if it's not, um, if there was no task, then we can just um, uh, get the value um, straight out of the store and return it. So this build system is very small. It's also a bit stupid. If the two different tasks depend on the same key, it will rebuild it twice. So it's like a completely non-memoized build system. Now I want to just pause and say, why do we make tasks so polymorphic, right? What's this for all F doing? And it's because we can use the same task but execute it in different Fs for different purposes. The two particular purposes that we use um, primarily are, one, execute it to actually do the work, but secondly, to execute the task in a sort of um, very weak F that all it does is gather dependencies. This was a total surprise to me when Andre first showed, showed this to me. Here it is. So dependencies takes a task in, a, in an applicative and returns a list of keys, that is, the keys on which that task depends. So you can, as it were, run the task in a funny kind of sandbox, and it just returns the keys that it needs. And this is a one-line definition of what um, dependencies is relying, completely relying on the polymorphism of tasks in the, in the F. So I think it's worth pausing just to contemplate the grandeur of that single line, but I shall not hesitate, shall not stop to explain it. Um, but I only have eight minutes and 50 seconds. All right. So, um, uh, so now what, so that's what the, uh, that's about the F. What about these C things? That is, the constraints that the F must satisfy. So here are the ones we mainly use. 
Applicative and monad, I mentioned before. So applicative means that no ta the task cannot, you cannot bind the result of a task in, uh, in, in, in using it for the next. When you, get, when you run the callback, you can't bind the result of the callback and use that to decide what to do next. So if you're an applicative, you, can only, you, you can't use the result of computing one dependency to decide which other dependencies to now look at. So that means that, in effect, you're forced to only use static dependencies. So we can classify into static dependencies just by saying we're going to use an applicative. With a monad, you get dynamic dependencies, and functor and alternative are, are, are also useful alternatives here. Uh, but we, in the paper, we mainly use functor, uh, um, static, uh, monad, and applicative to classify static and dynamic dependencies. OK, last piece. I want to describe another um, insight that I think you'll get when you read the paper, which is a sort of way to classify um, build systems and understand their design choices, and indeed to find new ones. So we classify them along two axes. One is the scheduler, which describes which task should be executed, which, which task should be executed in which order. And the second is the rebuilder that says, once you've decided that task has to be executed. You've got to say, um, maybe we don't actually need to run it. Maybe we've got it. It's kind of like the memoization mechanism that says maybe we don't need to do it because we already have it. We already have its result. Um, we found that there were three different schedulers we identified in the literature and, and the existing artifacts, three different schedulers, and four different rebuilders. And moreover, we could turn those schedulers and rebuilders into, oh, beg your pardon, so then, um, uh, in this classification, almost all the other smaller build systems that are not mentioned on this slide tend to show up in the top right-hand corner. We also find that you could take the, um, uh, the, these three different schedulers and four different rebuilders and express them as Haskell functions. So now, what is a scheduler? A scheduler is a function from a rebuilder to a build system. I gave you the signature of a build system before, but a, but a scheduler takes a rebuilder and produces a build system. That's all a scheduler is. What's a rebuilder? It's something that takes a key and a value and a task provided by the user that says how to build this dependency, and it sort of wraps it in some extra stuff that decides you know, uh, to conditionally execute the user-supplied task, and then it needs a bit of state associated to do that. So schedulers and rebuilders have first-class types, and then we can... Um, and we can make functions. So topological restarting and suspending all have type scheduler. The things in the vertical column all have type rebuilder. And now we can build any, we can build uh, whatever it is, uh, four times three is uh, 12, 12 different uh, build systems just by applying one to the other. So make is the result of applying the topological uh, scheduler to the mod time rebuilder, rebuilder. And all combinations make sense. So, um, uh, so that can be, and that's directly reflected in the, in the Haskell model. So I want to finish just by describing what good properties we can then get from, uh, from the system. So uh, we get, um, uh, here are our initial, our initial classifications, right? But um, if, you, if you just take um, uh, the topological scheduler, what does the topological scheduler do? It runs that um, dependencies function, do you remember? It runs the dependencies function on all of the tasks to extract their static dependencies, then it topologically sorts them, and then it runs the task in a suitable topologically uh, sorted way. That's the way make works. But if you do that, you don't get dynamic dependencies. Um, the restarting scheduler turns out to be not minimal. It repeats some work. Um, the, uh, the two um, uh, rebuilders that, um, or that use dirty bits and verifying traces don't give you cloud builds. Um, and um, the, um, uh, Nick, using deep constructive traces, so-called, you can read about them in the paper, doesn't give you early cutoff. So there's a sort of suggestive hole in this, and indeed, uh, uh, here it is. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a hole that was quite, initially, nobody, it's, the reason it's empty is because it has a good combination of properties. You get cloud build stuff, and you get early cutoff, and you get dynamic dependencies. Um, and that's a combination that was intellectually hard to get into your head at a time, so nobody built it. But having done this kind of um, uh, this analysis, we then find we could build it in uh, you know one line with four lexings on it, right? This is uh, effectively cloud shake. It gives you all of these very nice properties together. So um, remember, I say that, uh, when I say this, this is a you know one line build system. All of the build systems in the paper, and there are quite a few, are described in um, uh, uh, you know in, in a, a, a dozen or so lines of Haskell. Um, it's all, you know, it's all statically typed, and they're all executable, and they're all available from a, an, an open source repository. You can try them out. You can try out other variations um, of build systems. 
Um, but, but they are only models, right? This is, you can't build a real build system in 20 lines of code, right? Real build systems are hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and they do tons of stuff that we're not modeling at all. There's parallelism, there's non-determinism, there's dealing with failure and recovery, and there's, you know, trying to um, uh, distribute all of this across your data center. So it's only a model, but that's a strength as well as a weakness because, because it's small, it's intellectually tractable, and you can invent new things that we you know, haven't been able to do at scale before. And hopefully then, having invented that new thing, we can scale it up. Um, so there's quite a bit of um, uh, further reading uh, here. I hope that you read the paper. There's some blog posts about this, um, and it's all uh, readily available online. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Simon. So Jeremy Gibbons, uh, Michael D. Adams, I'm both wondering about what do our system that might have cycle dependencies? Oh, cyclic dependencies. So uh, we don't do cyclic dependencies, yes. So if, you're, if uh, a particular um, file depends on itself, uh, or in Excel, if a cell depends on itself, we're just not going to do that. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Right. Have you <laughs> thought about that a little bit? Uh, or? No. All right. It's a bad idea. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you kind of have to do one thing well rather than everything badly. So. Right. Uh, maybe, so. maybe there's some smart research students in the audience. Maybe you can figure out how to make research All work. All right. So, yeah, and there is a synonymous uh, question. So in the table that you show, there are some uh, empty uh, oh, rubrics, yeah. right? So are those opportunities or are combinations that they do not make sense? So, uh, so I think, are these, you know, are the empty um, boxes opportunities? Well, so here are the empty boxes, um, and, but they, uh, they, they all seem less attractive to us than uh, the green box here, because they all suffer from, you know, one or more of these uh, disadvantages. Sorry, sorry, what? can we put the slides on, on the screen? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, was it, was, it was just a bit of a delay, right. <laughs> so they all, uh, yeah, the empty boxes, which are, come on, empty boxes. Um, the empty boxes here, uh, they all suffer from one or more of these disadvantages. Only the green, it was a bit of, this was a complete surprise to us. We didn't set it up this way. Only the, uh, and the green box was also empty, by the way, right? So we just filled the green box. Um, but the other ones are, you know, vacant. And maybe also perhaps there are other schedulers or other rebuilders that would fill out more boxes. We don't know. These are just the ones that we found, you know, in the wild so far. Right. All right. So let's thank Simon again. Okay, good. Thanks.